I should note, um, and I still remiss for not doing that already, that um, uh, that I uploaded all the, the videos from yesterday to the site as anticipated, and you welcome to um, go to the YouTube site and, and find those, uh, those videos, okay? Um, uh, I am also defining some new slides and will be updating the slides folder hopefully by tonight with, uh, with some new material as well. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about these aspects of study planning. Um, we've seen that with the Ethica system, um, defining a new study at a mechanical level is completely straightforward. Uh, it involves pointing and clicking at a bunch of elements, and literally within minutes, you can arrive at uh, a deployable mHealth study, um, all the elements of that mHealth study. And people can, on iPhones or, or Google smartphones, Android smartphones, they can go and, um, and opt in. Um, but that belies the fact that um, Beneath that is a whole edifice of needing to think what study do we want to build. So in short, Ethica has, has uh, I think we could generally say, transformed the situation from one where, we're, where the work goes on in building the study and implementing it and realizing the, the software for it and testing it and all that sort of work that, that has to go into uh, the technical components of F health traditionally. It's transformed that to be um, something that's uh, much more um, contained and, and small in its, in its footprint and type and as far as time for, for health researchers is concerned. It can be done very quickly. Where the real thinking has to go on is the study planning, the study operation, and then the analysis phase. And uh, uh, in those areas, uh, um, I'm hoping to, in all those areas over the next few days, I'm hoping to provide some, some pointers. So, you know, broadly, if you look at the literature related to, to M Health, uh, to mobile health, um, uh, we can we can broadly characterize much of it as as distinguished into two pieces, uh, cases where smartphones and mobile technologies, including wearables are used for surveillance purposes and where they're used for interventions. And I would argue that the intervention focus is actually remains more prominent in the literature, although there's certainly a lot uh, on this area of, of, of using them as, as tools for gathering information, for monitoring, or what I'll use in a very broad sense as surveillance, okay? Um, and um, the truth is there's a certain amount of of both that goes into many studies. Um, you know, much of the motivation, for example, for smartphones and surveillance is understanding health behaviors, exposures, um, and, um, you know, as part of this, the phones are used for convenient delivery of surveys rather than having paper survey instruments we give to people it can be delivered on device, in situ, wherever they are, which has a lot of attractions as attractions for reaching out to groups that are marginalized or very difficult to reach otherwise homeless people, um, for reaching out to younger people who might not respond to random digit dialing, might not have a landline. Um, and, uh, and it can involve convenient delivery of these ecological momentary assessments at, at random times during the day or, or at triggered times, right? triggered by context. Very important motivations for using them for surveillance. Smartphones as interventions um, uh, have uh, a number of, of ways in which they, uh, they act. Um, one way is, is enhancing participant learning. For example, graphing out, um, we've done some work along these lines um, for women with gestational diabetes, having them uh, record their blood sugar levels over time and then plotting it out for them so that they can see something about their trajectories of blood sugar and learn what other factors in their lives might be changing them. Imagine a timeline where you can see their blood sugar levels over time and we have pointers to the timeline for when they ate, when they exercised, etc. Um, smartphones interventions can, can trigger sort of reflection. Um, some of uh, my colleague Regan Mandrick's work here and, and some of that uh, uh, 
that that has gone on with the IFE system is is worthy of note. So you know she had this food of food photo food diary where people were asked to take photos of the food and comment on them um, in terms of healthiness and very importantly later reflect on them so they had photos of the food that they had eaten in the past week or the past month which they having taken those photos day in day out and commenting on it they could then reflect on the past month look at a big you know the food there and that's what one of the aspects of what Kevin refers to as a more perfect mirror, you know, provides people um, some ability to go from each meal in isolation to the bigger picture of what are they eating, what are they filling their bodies with day after day. Um, and you might notice patterns there that weren't otherwise immediately evident in the moment-to-moment -moment experience of, of, uh, of um, the puzzle muscle of each day. Predictably, when you start adding up the, the snacks, and um, the sugar sweet beverages, et cetera. Uh, another you know, big modality for unhealth here is messaging to participants. You know, messaging that's preset or that's contextually triggered. And there's a lot of potentials uh, here for, um, for this area and a lot of studies which have sought to provide reminders, nudges, um, uh, and, and, and encouraging messaging to two individuals to you know stick with an exercise regimen or to uh, uh, to remember their goals as far as healthy eating or or uh, what have you. Um, uh, some some smart modes of interventions have sought to work through social sharing, um, and others in terms of um, uh, building networks is is one component uh, related to sort of intervention studies that some have explored. And, and some of our colleagues, formerly in Canada, but now in Australia, um, Penny Haw and, and Alan Shield talk a lot about the importance of building networks as part of complex interventions. Um, and uh, smartphones can play a role in all of these areas. And I would argue that the Ethica Health Platform um, could in fact play a role in either of these domains. Um, uh, messaging, um, messages that are contextually triggered, for example, might be pre-programmed in a survey. Mohammed noted earlier that if we're thinking about interventions, um, as long as we can take the desired messaging and, and elements and render it into a, a questionnaire, in principle, uh, Ethica could, well, Ethica could play, play some role here. Um, uh, but there are certain types of smartphone and intervention tools where it would, be, uh, it would not be easy right now. So sending someone a video, for example, is just not, not something that's part of the, the Ethica platform at the moment. Um, uh, we might measure the networks in which people are circulating, um, and one could imagine uh, feeding back information on pe uh, to people um, on an occasional basis on on um, others nearby them who might share similar interests or similar struggles. Um, but right now, um, there's not a big, um, a big component of the system that's designed to sort of make that uh, possible on a moment by moment basis, detecting who's nearby and triggering something based on that. Um, the fact is here that um, things operating the left often end up having some influence on the right. So, Using smartphones or wearables for data collection often has the potential to influence behavior. Um, uh, and this is, Mohammed mentioned yesterday, the Hawthorne effect, cases where people modify their behavior um, if they know they're being mo monitored, for example. But you know, it also leads to for peppering people with questionnaires day in, day out, they may reflect on those questionnaires. If they're being asked to take a photo of their food um, as part of a routine monitoring of their food intake, um, even without a reflective photo food diary and so on, if they're just being asked to, to photograph that food, as was done for Aydin's, uh, the study in which Aydin helped set up together with Mohammed on foodborne illness, that might cause them to reflect on, on their food. It might remind them of health considerations that they're being asked about exposure to you know, about personal protective behavior for exposures to uh, 
uh, to tick-borne infection and or to mosquitoes. Um, and there may be a perception that the research team may judge their behavior and things like screen time that, that may end up altering their behavior. So there is, there is the reality that when we, when we ask people to download an app, install it, and use it, um, whether it's monitoring things in the background or asking them questions, there is a potential for behavior change there. Hopefully it's behavior change for the better, but there is some potential that will simulate that. Um, and if we're thinking about the reverse, data collection interacting for intervention studies, certainly data collection mechanisms can leverage intervention effectiveness. If we're interested in nudging people, um, uh, we, can, we can better understand how to do that through uh, collected data. We can identify appropriate times, perhaps, for messaging. It's the sort of thing that, um, that Refod is looking at. When, when are times that people tend to answer their questionnaires issued on the device? What is it about a circumstance, a time of day, the location of the person at home or at work, the uh, level of activity of the person as measured through some of the sensors like accelerometry or what have you? Could those give clues as to when you might want to message them with a pep? a little peppy um, uh, message that encourages them to stick by an exercise regimen or, or that um, it encourages them to remember to take their medication. When are times that might be more effective? Um, so we might trigger questionnaires or prompts at, at appropriate times um, for messaging. And of course, I, I argued that we could recognize which pathways are being successfully changed by an intervention delivered by a smartphone or otherwise, and use it to better, um, um, to better improve uh, the design of, the, of that intervention. Okay, let's talk about some common stages of the participant experience. Um, first of all, I should mention, and I stand remiss um, for not having a separate slide on this. I, I aspired to do it, but uh, uh, having run into a flat tire on the way in, I ran out of time. Um, so, um, uh, one thing I want to say is that these studies that we're talking about here are typically best undertaken um, in a twofold fashion. So, the first is to roll out a pilot or feasibility study. And sometimes those are separate, even. But um, the feasibility study being to understand, you know, how, to what degree is this going to apply in terms of asking people to take photos of this circumstance or, or to, to get them to answer these questions this many times per day. To what degree are they really going to be able to be willing to wear that watch day in, day out? To what degree are, are caregivers really going to be willing to take the time to put a watch on an infant, you know, to, to recognize stress levels or on, on a young child? To what degree is that watch going to survive the challenges and the challenging environment of young children. Uh, the fact that there's sometimes uh, uh, liquid intrusions on, on the childhood environment. Um, to what degree are there, um, uh, uh, is, is someone going to be willing to, to give a response to a free form question, whether by audio or by, by text? To what degree are they really gonna take the time to do that? These are feasibility questions that are often uh, fairly fundamental. And by running a feasibility study, you can get you know, significant insights about what's going to fly, what might not. And you might alter your study accordingly. For example, one study we're involved in right now, and this is, this is a pattern that I've seen uh, for several, um, you know, uh, recognize that while we'd like to get this sort of uh, detailed information, um, it might be too much, and so we'll we'll give each participant um, a lower a lower burden regimen for the study as a whole, but but ask them for one week's time to go that extra mile and record things in more detail to to provide that extra level of, of insider detail to be aware. And we saw how it could be enabled yesterday via the the interface that certain types of sensors will only be enabled for that week, or certain types of surveys will be asked more, or they'll be asked for that particular week to, 
be sure to photograph every time they take a drink or eat to photograph that thing. And they know it's for a week's duration, it's fine time, maybe they get compensated more for that week. And, and um, with that understanding, they might opt in or you know, actually go through with it better than if it was all through the study. So sometimes less is more. Um, and um, that's something we could, we could probe with a feasibility study or adapt to with a feasibility study if we decide the certain regimen is just too onerous. You know, we end up going with one where it's very defined duration um, in a way that's shared with participants. So the point is, feasibility studies, on the one hand, and pilot studies, which look at, you know, the uh, uh, testing out the anticipated regime for any issues for from the standpoint of the amount of time that's required on the part of study personnel um, that help us understand for the study personnel um, the level of technical expertise they're going to need to answer for participant questions. These are commonly an earlier stage of studies and. I would be hesitant to recommend anyone to deploy a system at scale without having first tested it. Um, if there's, unless it's you know a very close replication of something that's been done in the past, or or um, otherwise has features which one has empirical reason to believe are are readily doable. So having a separate feasibility slash pilot phase um, is very attractive for practical reasons and for ethics, as it turns out. Because you know the ethics review board will often be expecting, uh, in a feasibility study, a certain amount of rejigging of things, and they're not going to raise eyebrows like they would if you rejig a full study. Okay, so getting experience on the small before you roll it on the large is, is strongly recommended. What are some stages of participant experience for a, a broad study? Well, encountering promotion learning more about, so there might be a website that would clue you in to features of this study. Um, there might be uh, information that's available uh, that's sent to them um, uh, if they inquire or what have you, so they learn some about it. In some cases, people inquire to us via email and they're, they might be uh, contacted and, and have an in-person meeting or they might be sent information. Um, they might take an eligibility survey, which which basically tests their ability to their their whether they fit within the criteria for the study. Um, are they 18 or over? Are they, you know, a resident of this area? Uh, do they have this condition that we're interested in looking at? Are they the appropriate gender or what have you? Um, now, uh, if they pass that eligibility survey. They might then watch or be delivered information needed for informed consent. And uh, in many of our studies, this has taken place in person. But in other studies, um, we've sought to deliver this sort of information via a video um, used online. And Mohammed has some example videos which um, uh, which could serve as kind of exemplars that that help help an understanding of, of how you might um, deliver content remotely, both for uh, both for providing background information about the study, setting up the phone, et cetera. And, and video for informed consent is, is one of those pieces that um, you know, could be considered via video if you're asking large numbers of people to consider downloading, downloading the app. Um, now, um, they would then, in, in many cases, offer consent. They opt in. Um, and uh, we try to work to make sure in the material that it's informed consent. Um, this process is more involved if it's a child that's being sought because there's parental consent and then a uh, child assent if the child is old enough to sort of opt in. And if the child opts out, even though the parents offered consent, the child's not going to be in that study, okay? So, and you need to deliver material for this that's, you know, age appropriate, et cetera. Um, now, if they do opt in, though, and assent is given for a child, then there there often be an entry survey, an entry questionnaire 
that's a baseline questionnaire that would gather their information. And this would often include things like their demographics, aspects of their background, um, little changing types of information, you know, have they smoked 100 cigarettes or more in their life, that sort of information. Um, and then there's going to be a long component, which is going to be very specific to your study, which involves participation um, on their part. And, you know, there, there's going to be a variety of mechanisms, sensor mechanisms, the button pushing proactively, and questionnaires, which will be used here. Um, and, and then there's several types of exits. There's opting out of the study, and uh, Ethica has, if I'm not mistaken, an opt-out sort of questionnaire that, that's asked for people who choose to leave the study. And in fact, if you look on your phones from yesterday, you will see for some of those studies under Ethica, you'll see a leave study button or leave button, which you could push. And this instrument might be then asked of you if there is an instrument delineated. But then there's a separate completion uh, step when someone completes a study, which would involve a different, might involve a different instrument being asked for them. Um, is that fair to say, Mohammed? Yeah. Um, and um, and uh, later today, I think when we're talking about defining questionnaires, you could see how how that would um, you know this this is accomplished. The different types of survey instruments that can be provided. Um, uh, so. One thing I'll highlight here is um, I've left strategic ambiguity in these, this slide as to exactly where the app is downloaded, okay? So at a mechanical level, when in this process have they downloaded the Ethica app on their iPhone or on their Android phone? Well, uh, Ethica does support asking eligibility surveys on the device with the Ethica app. However, um, to do that, clearly you need the app on your device. Now, in the fullness of time, um, that might be less of and less of an issue because the way we envision things, increasingly there's going to be a, um, there's likely to be a, a population of people who already have Ethica on their system and they might opt in to a new study. Maybe they even learn about it through the app. Uh, and they might opt into a new study. They already have Ethica on their system. And so they're just seeing if they're eligible for the new study. And if they're not, they won't be in the new study. But they're not going through any rigmarole. Now, if you look at the first time, it may be onerous to ask them to go through these steps, to read about downloading the app. And when you download the app and install it, you're asked this information by Android, for example, saying it collects this sort of information. That might be awfully onerous for people to go through before, before going through an eligibility survey, which tells them, well, they're not eligible after all. Um, so in many cases, the eligibility survey for people who are likely to be first-time users might be something you do online, for example, uh, to figure out if they're eligible. And if so, then they download the app um, and are provided information for informed consent and can offer consent on the app. Alternatively, it may be that this whole process is done online and they only download the app here and take the baseline entry survey, you know, having, having provided that informed consent because there is the option that they might opt out at this point. Um, uh, Mohammed, is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, and one thing to consider is that uh, based on the ethics application, whether we are allowed to uh, record any data uh, before they have provided a consent, because they have to pass the eligibility survey first, then they give the consent. So if they, they don't consent, are we allowed to report that their responses to the questions that we have asked, or we are not? And usually the answer is that we are not allowed to, to report those data, or be discarded. So, uh, right now, the way that the app operates is that no, nothing is reported from the time before they actually consent to join the study. So basically, you don't get any responses about the eligibility service. So uh, it's a bit tricky because you don't know why they are ineligible. Uh, and I assume if we want to have the same approach on the website, you know, on the website, it should follow the same uh, protocol, uh, the same pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and and we'll be spending 
be significant time talking about the ethics uh, side of things tomorrow. Uh, but um, that's a very good point. Um, so, you know, where you draw the line here will probably depend about where they actually download the app. And it will depend again on whether people are likely already have it or, or, or not, okay? Um, so that was a little bit on the participant experience. And what I'm going to